Welcome to Second Opinion, the reviews show here on the Nexus. Today, Ian Arbuck and Ian Decker will be sharing their experiences with Titan's Grave, the Ashes of Volcana. Find the show notes for the episode at thenexus.tv slash SO2. So Ian, what is this uh, Titan's Grave thing? I'll tell you that in a sec. Just why are you Ian R. Buck? You've always gone by Ian Buck. Yes, so I, I am rebranding uh, because years and years ago when I first signed up for my Gmail account, Ian Buck, dot Buck was taken, so I had to take Ian dot R. Dot Buck, and so that's what I've gone by for most places, like my Twitter handle is that, and um, you know, so eventually when I get myself a website, it's going to be ianrbuck.com because that's not taken. Um, and so I figure, you know, uh, just to be consistent, I might as well, whenever going by my full name, stick the R in there as well. Okay. Plus, it'll help me to get out of uh, Ian Buck's shadow, who works at NVIDIA, or at least used to work at NVIDIA, because he's rather famous, and he shows up on all of the Google searches. <laughs> so if people are searching for Ian R. Buck instead of Ian Buck, they're more likely to find me. Yeah. See, I'd think of a sassy thing to come back, but I'm a little bit too tired right now. So let's go. <laughs> <laughs> all right. I- so- Go ahead. So you were asking me what Titan's Grave, the Ashes of Volcana is, right? Yes. So Titan's Grave, the Ashes of Volcana is a story and RPG system that was put together by Will Wheaton. He and a group of four actors, um, primarily voice actors. Yes. Yeah, I think. Well, uh, not not quite all of them are actors. They're they're all kind of minor celebrities. Um, okay. Yeah, a few voice actors. Um, you know, Hank Green has his own uh, the Vlog Brothers YouTube channel and everything, yeah. and he's an entrepreneur and stuff. And and Yuri. So so let's see. So we had Will Wheaton, obviously, Laura Bailey, who was Lemley, mm-hmm. Hank Green, um, who is Ankia, who is Ankia. Let's see. Who are the other? Uh, let's see. We had Allison Hayslip who played Kiliel, and uh, Yuri Lowenthal played Slethk. Yeah. So, as you said, people whose names you probably don't recognize, but definitely voices you will recognize. Yeah. Um. And so they so they were playing through this uh, RPG system together, and uh, the Titans Grave Ashes of All kind of that we're talking about mm-hmm. is the video series that they put out. Yes. Um. Of the of of their adventures. Yes. Um, and it's it's mostly um, mostly footage of them sitting around a table playing the game, interspersed with like artistic renditions of the the action that's going on in the game, mm-hmm. um, which is something we talk a little bit about later. Yep, yep. Um, so if you listen to this episode and uh, you seem you're very very interested in in watching this thing, uh, go ahead and find it at the the links that we provide in the show notes. Um, they've got a playlist on youtube with the whole thing um and of course geek and sundry on their own website they've got a bunch of good titan's grave stuff i'm sure they have merch as well merc yes well i i call it merch because it's short for merchandise Merchandise. yeah 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 Yeah. as opposed to merc which is short for mercenary oh i just realized how awful that is i hate it (laughs) okay And I mean, you can go to Geek and Sundry for things other than this too, just because they have a bunch of other really cool stuff on mm-hmm. Geek and Sundry. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm I'm a pretty big fan of their like original scripted shows because um, they've got, uh, of course, the Guild, um, which is pretty pretty old now um, and actually kind of predates the Geek and Sundry as a company. <laughs> um, and actually, they're currently they're doing one called LARPs. Uh, so maybe they should call themselves the Guild and Sundry. Maybe. Yeah, if it was built off of the reputation of the guild, and that's yeah, I don't, I don't know how direct it was from that, but yeah, that okay. that was one of Felicia Day's projects before I think before Geek and Sundry really became its own company. Okay, anywho, anywho, uh, so let's talk about the setting. Um, I was I as soon as I heard about this uh, when Will Wheaton was slowly announcing bits and pieces of it, um, I was immediately really excited because of the combination of science fiction and fantasy that they were putting together in this world. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's something that you you don't really see too often, um, but I really, really dig it. Yeah. No, and, it, go ahead. And, and of course, uh, I, I tend to kind of root for the technology mm-hmm. solutions to things over the, you know, magic-based solutions to things. Uh, so I was rather inclined to root for the people with guns. And I'm kind of the other way around. Yeah. Where I tend to root for magic things, though. In this case, I was rooting for Lemley, so fists. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> and I I was rooting for Lemley, of course, because she had robot fist, robot uh, blade fist thing. 
Dr. Lobotomy. Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, of course, it, it was a world with uh, a bunch of ancient evils that haven't been seen in millennia. Um, and I, I really enjoy that trope. It kind of reminds me of A Song of Ice and Fire, hmm. um, which is uh, I, I need to get back into that book series but man those books are long and i don't have time anymore yeah i i tried starting to read one once and i just i i do need to pick it up i do want to pick it up i just haven't had much of a chance to. Mm-hmm. and <clears throat> i agree i love the the melding of the sci-fi and the fantasy themes um and that obviously i mean i'm not surprised because it's well wheaton there was still a big appreciation for beer because <laughs> the beer baron <laughs> yep um but i'm I'm also a little disappointed that he didn't necessarily work on creating more of the world as in the people in the world and a lot of the politics that happen in the world. Mm -hmm. So, like, there were obviously a bunch of different races. How do those races meld together? Uh, Like, what racial tensions are there? How how do, do each of the races, do they all meld together in one big city or in several big cities? Or do they have their own sort of capitals mm-hmm. for different areas? How do the societies between each differ? Um, we got to glimpse that kind of thing a little bit through some of like the kind of personal backstories of, of the characters. Um, you know, so like Sleth, who is uh half orc, half s- whatever they call the lizard people. In Saurian? That- yes. Saurian. Um, you know, he, he uh, had a few scenes where he, like the, the orcs would completely shun him when they found out that he was half Saurian, you know, and he yeah. kind of had to hide his face and stuff. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't like super uh kind of laid out bare for the for the viewer what all of these issues necessarily were yeah and i mean in some ways i can also if that was a choice i can also respect that choice just mm-hmm. because um a lot of the culture that we see and we develop as a culture um or actually the majority of the culture is in the stuff that we don't see so like little mannerisms, what is what is accepted to be polite, what is accepted to be impolite. Mm-hmm. Um, those vary from culture to culture. And although there's the big things that we can see, like food is the food and music, yeah, and art are the big things that people think about when we think about culture. But it's also all the little things. So there's there is always that bit of a blindsiding that comes whenever you enter into a new culture because you're not used to all the mannerisms and the customs. And I and I know as if if we were playing this uh, RPG system, you know, I always want to know as much about the setting as i can because you know like my character is going to know about it so if i'm going into it you know i should have that background Mm -hmm. um so i hope that i hope that the players uh in titan's grave were briefed on a lot of these things beforehand (laughs) that would make sense yeah i mean isn't there a book that came out with it or is this just his homebrew stuff i'm not sure um i because i know that will wheaton and his son uh wrote most of this stuff in the months leading up to when they were shooting the show Mm. um so i don't i don't know how if they had like one volume to read on that yet or or what um but um but yeah I i think that they have released it as an rpg system since then we'll have to look into that yeah yeah most definitely um, so kind of tying into the setting is the specific story that they were telling. Mm-hmm. Um, what'd you think of it? I honestly, I thought it was a little bit short. I mean, I'm also used to sort of grand novel-esque and anime-esque mm-hmm. stories where it's like, you think you have the bad guy cornered several times, but I, I felt like almost things were too easy for the heroes. They didn't get beat up enough to make me root for them. Right. Yeah. We did. We did see a couple of times where it was like, "Oh, this enemy is doing how much damage to us?" Uh, mm-hmm. But you know, then as soon as Lemley showed up and was able to like kick some butt, then <laughs> then everything was okay. Yeah, and I mean, there was definitely some emotional beating up that was happening. With oh, some yes. backstory, and I do appreciate that. Um, but a lot of the situational stuff, they were able to get out of a lot of the situations with almost Deus Ex Machina things, where it's just things happen to be in the right place at the exact right time. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, so it didn't feel like there was as much struggle as would have been for super captivating drawing in stories. Yeah, a lot of yeah, a lot of the struggle that did happen seemed like it was kind of premeditated mm-hmm. um, by by the game master, by the writer. Yeah. Um, and of course, if, I mean, if you if you you're disappointed that it's uh, not long enough, of course, there's going to be a sequel. Yeah. <laughs> Which there, is- they're going to be doing a season two. So good because there were also some questions that were definitely left unanswered. So like one of the things was Lemley's amulet. The the crest on the amulet had supposedly been despised, mm-hmm. and we never learned why. Especially when never mind. I'm not going to 
give that <laughs> um, But we do learn some stuff about her family, but never why they were despised. Yeah. And yep. I mean, that's just one of a few things. So this uh, kind of segues nicely into the characters. Um, so I, I really appreciated that most of the characters had quite a bit of depth. Um, you know, in, in the few RPG campaigns that I've actually been a part of, um, I didn't really give that much thought to the backstory of my character and then, like, kind of discovered who they were uh, as we played. Um, whereas, like... Um, they, they were very intentional about, uh, setting up these backstories for their characters. So, like, each, each one of the player characters already had a major goal, um, and several minor goals, um, that were specific to them. And so the, the players, I think, were allowed to come up with those things, but they, they had to premeditate those, uh, so that they knew their character before the, the whole game started. Yeah. And it helps to have people who are, like, good, Good, good artists, so good actors, good storytellers, mm-hmm. doing that sort of thing, because then the characters are so much more in depth, and the characters are so much more relatable. Oftentimes, as opposed to just the usual, oh, backwater, I'm nowhere, and then suddenly I'm, I'm, I'm the greatest thing for forever and ever. Yeah, like Bioware, <laughs> Bioware, <laughs> Bioware story. <laughs> Bioware's very, very specific interpretation of the hero's journey. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um. One thing that I had wished that Will had kept up, so he had done this a little bit towards the beginning, but then eventually stopped about halfway through the season or so, was there were a lot of secrets that were being kept. Mm-hmm. And so that was creating some interesting tension between the characters and some interesting interactions between the characters and the player characters themselves. Which, I mean, that also only happens when there's going to be good people behind those yeah. characters. Which actually is a really good segue to our next point. It's always, I mean, I, I, it's always really nice, uh, to see, uh, a game master who is malicious enough to try to turn the players against each other. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and that happened. There was a little bit of that, like, you know, why is Lemley keeping this secret from everybody else? But, you know, then the, the players all kind of trusted each other enough that none, nobody really pushed. Uh, you know, the, the issue kind of thing. Yeah. Um, but it, it you know, it could have turned into something. <laughs> <laughs> In other words, the, the majority of the, the feedback that we've had so far is, will Wheaton be meaner? <laughs> yeah. Which is funny because one of his, uh, uh, catchphrases is, don't be a dick. <laughs> um, so in terms of, uh, the, the, specs that the characters had since this is a role-playing game mm-hmm. um three out of the four seemed like they were pretty pretty nicely specced for combat yeah. um with you know a little bit of overlapping with uh you know some mechanic stuff and whatever um but then of course there was slethk who <laughs> <laughs> who is clearly like the um the 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 uh knowledgeable kind of mage character mm-hmm. um with more of an emphasis i think on the knowledge part than on the mage part <laughs> uh and still uh, learning. Yeah, yeah. And and then on top of that, uh unfortunately, he had quite a few really bad roles throughout the campaign. Uh in, and a few of those turned into kind of inside jokes in the series like the time that they were trying to sneak and he stepped on a bucket. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and so then every once in a while after that, somebody would bring up like, "Ah, oh, it's a good thing there are no buckets around right mm-hmm. now." <laughs> Final villain of the whole series. Yeah. <laughs> 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 anthropomorphized anthropomorphized buckets it's it's like the the um oh my gosh why can't i think of it the th- the scene from fantasia the the sorcerer's apprentice oh yeah yeah but, but with instead of mops buckets mm-hmm, mm-hmm. which go and attach themselves to everybody's feet so um as for the players uh it looked like it was a really really fun group to play with uh, they were having a good time. They were, you know, kind of building this camaraderie both inside the game and outside the game. Um, mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, every, everybody seemed really disappointed when the when they realized that the series was was over for this season. Mm-hmm. Um, not only not only because the, the story was left on a cliffhanger, but, you know, also because they weren't going to get to hang out until yeah. next time. Um, they should invite us for next time. Yeah, that would be great. <laughs> we just need to become 
uh, minor celebrities between now and, you know, next summer or whenever it's going to be filmed. So that's what this podcast is for, There right? you go. Yes. Everybody share this around so that we can become famous, please. Because <laughs> that's always happened. Help us with our goal. Um, all right. So, so yeah, we, uh, we've we been touching on these a little bit. But, yeah, um, Will Wheaton did a, a really, really great job of coming up with the whole setting and the story and everything. I felt like it was it was really really well written and really well put together um and uh and i love that he went to the effort of incorporating each of the characters backstories into the missions that they were doing Mm -hmm. um which is something that like you know as long as as long as you're able to do that kind of in a balanced way and not let let anybody feel left out Mm -hmm. it is a really really gratifying thing for a player to be like oh i'm special right now this (laughs) matters to me and like, my character. Like, like when I had you try and turn on your orphanage. Right. Yes, exactly. Um, and of course, since we only managed to have, what, two sessions of that campaign? Um, yeah, I was like the only one who got that personal treatment, um, which was, you know, nice. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, during during that campaign, nobody else was, you know, really engaged, yeah. which is unfortunate. I was trying. I know. I know. Um, uh, back to... Back to titan's grave um i did feel like will wheaton was being a little heavy-handed with like the guiding the players through the the campaign you know so like um for example when they were when they were traveling through that kind of underground area under the under the city um and they had a non-player character there with them and he kept you know going like hey we gotta go like let's go now and it was like okay uh, are you speaking directly to the players through the game you know and like um you know I, I it's okay to do that a little but like i felt like it was really really obvious um and kind of you know you know what i mean right? i mean part of that could also have been world building in that sense mm-hmm. or like tension building just because the you're putting the pressure on the characters to we gotta go, we gotta go, we gotta go, we mm-hmm. gotta go. But the ult- the the decision is ultimately there. Yeah, it, yeah, it always is. Um, of course, as somebody who's played a few too many video games, I'm always on the lookout for like what are the developers trying to tell me right now <laughs> through the level design. You know, so it was a, that was the kind of thing that I was kind of picking up on. Yeah. And I mean, there are also a lot of things that he did really well with sort of the improvising and trying to not necessarily have as much railroading. Mm-hmm. Um, so like with the five gold and a party. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That that was something that was silly and became an inside joke throughout the thing. But he ran with it instead of just going, OK, this is stupid. Yeah. He he did let them try and incorporate their ideas as much as he could. Also for combat. Being a good sport. And stuff. Yeah. So it was... And and he let the players also try improvised things mm, mm-hmm. throughout it too. So although he was somewhat railed, railroading with the story, the way that they got there from place to place, like the different interactions that they had, were still completely up to them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, which I appreciate. Um. So for the for the players themselves, uh, I felt like two of them really stuck out to me. Um, Laura Bailey. Uh, who played Lemley? Uh, she was great. Oh she man, was fantastic. she just got completely invested in her character. She was lively, you know. She um, she was hilarious. Yeah, she was, uh, and especially because she was playing like the uh, kind of the the dumbest uh, <laughs> character of the group. I really, really appreciate when players kind of have to rein in their own ideas for for what would be a smart thing to do right now, and just be like, "Well, I'm going to do the opposite." Yeah, you. Know? <laughs> We need to start up a campaign at, at the house because Peter, one of the campaigns that I had with Peter, he would take, he decided that he would go the opposite role, which for one, from what he usually plays, he usually goes for the really smart characters, so the spellcasters and whatnot. He decided to go with the dwarf barbarian. Yeah. Which he specifically lowered the, or not the charisma, the intelligence on, mm-hmm. which I said, that's okay so long as you up the charisma. <clears throat> I've heard some stories about where this went. <laughs> oh, yeah. It was great. So he would take, he would actually take self imposed intelligence checks on things to see, okay, am I going to make a good decision here? Nope, let's do this. <laughs> which led to some really interesting things like running down a hallway and then getting tripped and then shirt pop flap sorry shirt flapping up and his tramp stamp being revealed which he got after he passed out in the bar um which then infatuated several of the goblins and hobgoblins that were around but that's beside the point (laughs) (laughs) oh man um and then uh hank green i mean 
I already uh, Hank Green was already my celebrity crush before we watched this, <laughs> so I was ar- already watching him very carefully and stuff. Um, and he like I think he put a, a lot of effort into his backstory mm-hmm. um, because his character had um, some pretty complex stuff that she was dealing with. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, but I, I kind of felt like if if I had been playing a game with Hank, I would have just been like, "Shut up, Hank." so often because he was so snarky in a metagaming kind of way you know um and and actually in in the game uh once or twice will had to kind of punish him in game to be like you know hank just stop it right now this this is this is a serious moment you know like when he when he sent him outside of the of the shop where they were at the antiques shop where they were um you know because because he he wouldn't stop (laughs) See, I think there's no such thing as too snarky. I I enjoyed that, yeah, quite a bit. I mean, I it's always good to a limit, right? Because um, there's yeah. the, there's sometimes where like the the story, there's no way that your character would be snarky in in that moment. Um, and so if you're if you're meta game, you know, kind of trying to liven up the mood in real life, it's like, well, okay, we're we're actually in a dark place here. And, you know, like, I want to feel the emotions of the story itself. Yeah. Um, Yeah. Yeah. No, that's fair. Which is why I sometimes feel guilty when I, like, say something at in a theater while we're watching a movie. <laughs> I have a hard time shutting up, too. <laughs> Me three. Um, yeah. Yep. Uh, so those, I mean, the, the other two um, players, Yuri and, um, oh, gosh, what was her name? <laughs> Allison, um, I, we really like them too. Yeah, they. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, like, I think part of part of the problem with with uh, Slethk is just that he was he was kind of useless. It was just like, okay, we need a language check right now to see if we know what this wall says, and then it was like, oh, everybody understands because Slethk kind of um, described it to them, you know. But like, so he was yeah. the skill horn. He, he was the yeah. <laughs> Um, but not in a bad yeah. way. Those are really useful to have. You just have to make sure that you can protect them. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Mm-hmm. Which they were. They were. Some of his spells went off really well. Yes. Yes. And when they did go really well, they were epic. Uh, especially what I think. Yeah. Cause he managed to, well, I'm not going to say it. <laughs> Killing the big thing. Just shh. I just said the big thing. I know, but like, okay. Um, That's not specific. It's true. True. There were several big things. So there were. yeah. Um, so the format of the show, I really, really liked it. Um, I enjoyed, I, I think that the 40 minute episodes felt like a pretty good length. Um, maybe, maybe just a little bit shorter would have been, uh, a little bit better. Cause I mean, I'm a busy guy, right? You know? <laughs> um, so I, I think 35 minutes maybe would have been pretty ideal for me. Um, but it's not, it's not too bad. No. And actually, I went the other way. I would have liked them to be a little bit longer. Mm. Just because I felt that there were some things that were clipped short, like they would talk about some things in the intro to one episode that we hadn't seen in the past mm-hmm. episode. So it's like, oh shoot, we're missing stuff. I just thought of a way to get the best of both worlds uh, would be to make that that intro, uh, um, that that whole you know animation and everything with the narrator and stuff. Mm-hmm. I think that could have been a lot shorter because that after the first few episodes we actually started skipping that because like yeah. you know we've heard it all before we yeah. if somebody's going to jump into the middle of the series um it's all on youtube they can go back to the beginning with that you know it's not like it's being aired only at this particular time yeah um so i don't feel much pity for people who are going to start on episode five and not know what's going on <laughs> um so I th- yeah i think that the like last time on titan's grave could have been a lot shorter yeah well yeah, because as I said, there were some, definitely some things that happened that they talked about on last time in Titan's Grave that mm-hmm. they didn't show on the previous episode. Oh, did they? There were a couple of times when that happened, yeah. Oh, wow. Huh. So maybe we should have watched those. <laughs> so that's that's why I was saying it could have been a little bit longer because there were some things that it feel, felt like were cut mm-hmm. for the sake of getting it down to 40 minutes. And I th- I'm pretty sure that the show itself was actually uh, a little bit longer overall than they had originally uh, intended. Because I think that the the last episode was supposed to be another 40 minute episode, and then it ended up being a double length episode, so that they could mm-hmm. get all that everything at the climax in, yeah. um, which was a, a good decision uh, yes. because that was wow. Yeah. Um, though 
I did kind of get in trouble for watching the uh, double episode without realizing that it was going to be twice as long. Because <laughs> um, we were supposed, like, I think I was supposed to go grocery shopping or something with Savannah right after the episode was done. And then the episode ended up being twice as long as we thought it was. Uh, oops. Oh, well. I mean, she can go by herself if you guys. That's true, to. yeah. Um, <laughs> if it was an emergency. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, the production quality. Oh, man. I loved the stuff that they kind of overlaid on the, um, you know, while they were showing the, the players themselves, yeah. um, especially like the, the lower third where they had the dice, the die rolls, um, being, you know, the numbers showing up and stuff. And then like, if somebody was adding up things and saying it out loud, they would have their, their running tally going up and then like correct it as the person was like, Oh, wait, no, that's 16, not, you know, not 17. <laughs> yeah. Something like that. Um, that was cute. <laughs> That was fantastic. And then another thing that we had talked about earlier was the the art style, because there were oftentimes be pictures of art that they would flash up on the screen whenever they would pan away from mm-hmm. from the player's room. Um, and I actually really liked the art style. Um, so they had big brush strokes, uh, which kind of left some smeared-like details. Mm-hmm. Um, but that also sort of adds to the overall feel of the world, which made it just feel sort of grungy and just a little bit. Everything was hazy. Yeah, it kind of reminds me of the art style of um, the Telltale um, Game of Thrones game, because yeah. um, that that was supposed to be real painterly and um, yeah, and and kind of look like a, a moving moving picture instead of like actual three dimensional kind of objects, right? Yeah. Um, and well, I guess I can't say yeah, I haven't played it. Yet. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and I felt, yeah, for the most part, it worked really, really well. There were only a couple of times where like, you know, maybe a, an, an arm that they were rotating looked a little bit awkward, you know? Um, but it was, yeah, for the most part, those animations really helped me to kind of visualize what was going on. Um, and, and in the battle sequences, keep track of like, okay, how many enemies were there and how many of them are dead now and what's going on, you know? Mm. Um, cause a lot of times you have all these kind of faceless identical, minions coming at you and it's a big horde and it's like okay were there seven left now or were there five or i you know yeah yep the the battle cam cam. (laughs) helped a lot god i i I hate some of the the camera angles that pop up in games when you're in the middle of a fight oh in video games yeah especially if it just zips around so that i'm looking at a wall the battle's behind me i can't (laughs) do anything why uh thanks a lot third person action games (laughs) Um, so how about that RPG system? I, I really liked it. Um, at least from what I could tell. Cause it, it was really good at keeping the action going. So something, and these, these are some of the points that you had brought up that I actually really agree with. Um, is that using three dice pushes the majority of the rolls towards the middle of the pack. So that means that. Cause you can think of it kind of as a bell curve. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah, so you're, there's going to be more average dice because there's obviously more dice to roll. Mm-hmm. Um, so that also makes the spectacular moments that much more spectacular and the really unspectacular moments that much more <laughs> underwhelming and laughable. Um, but at the same time, they had the stunts, the stunt point system there, um, to kind of take those average ones where it's like okay well you 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 still hit um but it it wasn't like a natural 20 however you've got these stunt points that make it just a little bit more interesting a little bit more powerful than it normally would have been yeah um and by the way the the stunt points um activate when you have doubles of a particular number yep. on those three dice yeah i've actually one of the games that i play with the kids requires us to roll three dice and i swear in every single game every roll except for like one or two have doubles. Mm-hmm. And it's just like, why? That's, that's, <laughs> this is statistically not supposed to happen. Uh, yeah. I'd have to think about it more with six die or six, six sides and three dice. And yeah. yeah, I don't know. But the, the nice thing is that those stunt points work for both, um, the player characters as well as the non player characters. So that, that made combat in my eyes a little bit more balanced because it set up both sides to have either crushing successes or crushing defeats. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I appreciate that things were sort of balanced and that everything was unbalanced. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> <In some ways. laughs> anything could happen. Anything could happen. Um, and I mean, th- there were some ways that were really nice that sort of that that protected against that. So, like the armor gave damage reduction. Yep. 
to that. So the higher your armor, the 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 tankier your character was because you could take more damage before you actually received hit point damage. And that that was definitely their saving grace, mm-hmm. um, <laughs> because they they quite often were taking lots and lots of damage that then was reduced by quite a bit um, yeah. before it actually did real health. Yeah. So even the things that are overpowered have good checks and balances. Mm-hmm. So overall, it felt like the combat system was was really nice. Um, the only thing that I felt was actually sort of underpowered, and this might have just been because of the roles that we were seeing, <laughs> um, was was the spell casting stuff. Um, just because you had a very limited amount of spells for like what would be considered usually lower level spells. Mm-hmm. Um, so like magic missile, things that do a bit of damage. You had even a small amount of those spells to use. Um, and maybe it's just trying to avoid breaking spell casting to the point where they underpower it. But I don't know. That was, that was just my observation. But again, that, that might also just be biases based on the roles that we saw. So the way yeah. Saw in that. Yeah. Cause we only had one spellcaster in the group and it's kind of hard to know if he had spec'd it out a little bit differently. Would he have been, uh, you know, decently powered in combat? Yeah. Um, but I mean, you want to have a balanced party, so not everybody's going to be uh, combat focused, right? Yeah. yeah, and that's fine. Yeah, so we'll just have to get the book and read the book. Yep, yep. Oh, and it's worth noting that um, the the RPG system here was uh, created. I forget what what the actual system is called, um, but it was originally used in the uh, Dragon Age role playing game, um, and before Titan's Grave, that was like the only physical tabletop. RPG that used it. Um, and so they, uh, I guess the, Will Wheaton kind of took note of it and was like, hey, can we use this in our show? And, um, and I think the, the actual version of, of Titan's Grave, um, would be the second, uh, you know, role playing game that, you, yeah, that you can buy that uses this system. Yeah. And I mean, let's face it, with, with Felicia Day as part of Geek and Sundry, they kind of have an in when it comes to Dragon Age stuff. Oh, was she, did she voice it? She didn't voice it. She she fangirled so hard about it that she was actually able to get a DLC storyline that she helped write. Oh wow. And there's there's a YouTube series of with her acting this out last I remember. Nice. So so she's kind of big into the Dragon Age stuff. That's awesome. Stuff. One more reason why she's awesome. Mm-hmm. Nice. Uh so that's all that we have written down here. Um, I definitely enjoyed my time with Titan's Grave. Definitely going to be coming back for uh, season two. Um, I wonder, I'm not sure if they're going to be doing a Kickstarter for it or what, because uh, Titan's Grave actually only exists because of the Kickstarter for season three of Tabletop. Mm. Um, and it was one of the one of the stretch goals was doing a spinoff RPG show. Mm. Um, and that's what became titan's grave well let's hope it garners enough attention to the point where it can just fund itself oh heck yeah well yeah yeah um which is i mean pretty darn hard to do uh just by just from youtube revenue right you know um so i think that they're going to be making most of their money for titan's grave off of titan's grave related merchandise so bye 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 hey christmas is coming Depending on when you're listening to this. Winter is coming. <laughs> oh, wait. Winter's almost here. This is Minnesota. Mm-hmm. By that, I mean winter was here a month ago. And then it started raining because global warming? Because El Nino. Yes. Is that a, okay? Which means the Nino. <laughs> Did pers- you know that Elmo's name in Spanish means the, the Mo? Mo? I love that joke. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Chris Farley. <laughs> So, uh, Ian, where can people find you on the internet? Well, let's see. I mean, Facebook and whatnot. But Twitter, I'm um, uh, at Bigfoot1138. And as well as I'm on Steam as... I think right now I'm just Bigfoot. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> look, look for the um, Let Me Play You the Song of My People, and you'll find me. Ah, uh, yes. Yep, that's your profile picture. That's my profile picture. Um, and you can find me, Ian R. Buck, at Ian R. Buck. Uh, most places that I'm a person um, except for gaming related things where I go by Wolf Repo so that would be what you look for me on uh, on Steam as yep yeah. are you even even Ian Arbuck on your Gravatar? yes yep pretty sure um, but I mean Gravatar isn't like a, so- a social network it's that's just a system for distributing one y- well one profile picture to 
a bunch of different sites. Okay. Yep. Um, yeah. Uh, thanks for listening, everybody. If you uh, enjoyed this, then uh, you know, please share it around. Um, but more importantly, if you enjoy Titans Grave, share that around because holy cow, we want to support that. Yes, please. Um, until next time. So, dear listener, if you have any feedback for us regarding this episode of Second Opinion, feel free to hit that contact link over on the right side of the uh, show notes page. Or if you have an idea for something that you want to review for us on Second Opinion, uh, use that use the contact link to get in touch with us about that. We would love to hear from you. Bye. <laughs>